Joshua chapter 23. And if you just hold your finger there, we're also going to um, go to John chapter 10 and verse 10. John 10 and 10 and Joshua 23. Joshua 23, beginning with verse 8. But cleave unto the Lord your God, as you have done unto this day. For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong. But as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall cease, chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you, as he hath promised you. Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves, that you love the Lord your God. And John 10 and verse 10, The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I'd like to speak to you for a few minutes tonight on the subject spiritual anemia. Spiritual anemia. When we read this scripture about the abundance, um, the Greek word actually means exceedingly beyond measure. And that's what Jesus came to this world to save the sinner so that we could go and forever be with him. But until that time, God has ordained that we live and have an abundant life. But I dare to say tonight that most church people that I'm around, everywhere I go, don't seem to be living the abundant life. Spiritual anemia. Anemia is a condition where your blood is not, does not have the right amount of healthy red blood cells. It, this condition causes you, your cells, not to have the right amount of oxygen. And there's, there's many, many um, signs of having anemia, but the two biggest ones is tiredness and weariness. And I want to tell you tonight that that I believe the church in these last days, Jesus ordained for us to have the abundant life. And I don't believe for one minute that the Lord's coming back for a church out of the emergency room. I believe that God is coming back for a church that's victorious and, and, and raising the banner high for Jesus Christ. I believe that with all my heart. And there's many things today that's causing people to, to, hit, to be weak and weary and well-doing. And I suppose if we went through all the things that we could think of, we would be here all night. But there's four things I would like to bring out tonight that I feel that, that the Lord has laid on my heart to share with you that I believe is making Christians turn into having anemia. The first thing I would like to talk to you about tonight is that will cause you to have spiritual anemia is if you allow yourself to focus on people. The, the Bible doesn't tell us. How many times have I been in church services where the Lord will be a message in tongues or interpretation and the Lord will say, don't look to the right, don't look to the left, but look straight ahead. There's a reason for that, because if we get our eyes on people, we are going to be people most miserable. People do not seem to have the joy today. They don't have a smile on their face. I'll never forget, a lot of years ago, I went to speak in this one church, and this woman really stood out in my mind, and she still does to this day. She, I really do believe this woman needed to live her. But she sat in the church, on this side of the church, and she sat there the whole time with the meanest look on her face, with her hand folded, and would physically, all she could do to disagree with what I was saying. And it was very hard to teach or speak or preach under that, because even though I didn't want it to happen, my mind and my eyes kept drawing over to where she was. And if I would have allowed that, that would have robbed me of what I wanted to bring forth. You see, the devil is constantly setting out traps in our lives to mess us up. He knows what his end is. He knows that he's going to spend forever, forever, and ever, and ever in the lake of fire. Along with all his demons and imps. So his job is to keep us discouraged, keep our mind off the work of God, and do what he can do to distract us. But I have learned a long time ago that I can never, never measure myself with people. 
That's why we have to measure ourselves by the word of God. People are going to let you down. I tell people all the time that I could probably write a book on church hurts and how people have left me down and how people that I admired and sometimes even ministers did things that I didn't agree with. But it does not change the fact that he is still king of kings and he is still Lord of lords. And he is the one that I have to look to, not people, because people will definitely, definitely, definitely discourage me. They will get me down if I allow them. You know, people don't in the world, they, they, don't, they don't really want to see Christians excited. You know, I've heard people say, well, I... I don't understand why you have to act like that. You know, you can love God and you can just be quiet. Why do you have to shout and praise and dance and do all these other things? And I'm reminded of what Brother Kennedy said one day at a camp meeting. He said that he was having a church service and there were two quiet ladies in the back that were not Pentecostal. And he said at the altar service, it was a real good fiery service and and he said that these ladies motioned him back. So he went back, and she said, I just don't agree with that. She said, I don't understand why these people have to act like that. She said, why do people have to shout and yell and stomp and do all those things? She said, I don't understand. And he said, I answered her this way. He said, if you were in a burning building and you were about ready to die with no hope, and someone got you out of that fire, would you be all quiet and just say, thank you very much? No, you would be so excited and happy and joyful that that person allowed you to help you to escape from death. He said that's the situation for many people that are at the altar here tonight. They were in desperate situations, and they didn't know what way to turn, but they found God, and he is, was their deliverer, and that's why we are happy. That's why we shout. And I, I'll tell you, is it that we don't have problems? Yes, we have problems. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. And there's times in my life that I think, Lord, I just have to praise you through this because I don't know what else to do. And I realize that when I begin to praise and, and get excited about the things of God and get my mind off of people, I realize that it, it is like I love what the one singer up here said that night with that singing group. He said they need a dose of the ghost. I'll tell you, that's just been in my spirit ever since he said that. I thought, I felt it when he said it, and it's just been in there ever since. I'll tell you what, churches need a good dose of the ghost tonight. But we have to keep our eyes off of people. People will get you down. People will tell you things like, you don't have to be in church every Sunday. Well, I serve God out along the fishing creek. I serve God out there casting my line into the creek. I serve God in the mountains. Well, that's fine. You better be serving God everywhere you go. But I'm telling you, it's a sad day when we can't set aside a couple days a week, a few hours to be in the house of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So if you allow it, people will rob you, and they will have you become a spiritual anemic. The sin of drifting. If we were to turn, and I want to turn have time to turn to all these. If you want to, you can jot it down and read it later. Hebrew chapter 2 and verse 1 says, Therefore we should give the most earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. I think one of the most deadly sins that can creep up on us today is the sin of drifting. Many people are drifting and don't even realize that they're slowly but surely drifting away from God. Last month, when we went to visit Niagara Falls, I was standing there, and, and I was explaining some things to my husband about spiritually, and he said, you can make a sermon out of anything, but it wasn't that, but as I, as I saw that water, and you couldn't really see from one point that the falls was there, and I thought to myself, that's exactly how mankind is today. You know, they're heading towards the terrible falls, and they don't even realize it. They're drifting along like everything's okay in their little boat, seeing everything's okay with my four and no more, but they don't realize that there's a falls up ahead of them and that, and, and that they're, they're in danger. Relationships will always require something from you. You remember that. When I first met my husband, 
I didn't know the things that I know now. In fact, we've been together for so long that I can almost sometimes finish his sentences. And sometimes he can finish mine. And, and I'll say to him certain things sometimes, and he'll say, well, I knew what you would say about it. I knew how you would feel about it. He knows my little pet peeves. He knows I can't stand a clogged up, junked up countertop. He knows that. He knows that I can't stand dirty laundry piled up. Those are the little pet peeves. I mean, my house might not be real clean all the time, but my counters best not be junked up. That's just the way it is. That's one of my pet peeves. And, and I, know he, I know he does not like mayonnaise. He likes Miracle Whip over mayonnaise. I know all these little things about him. I know how he's going to feel about things. When the kids ask me something to ask Dad, I don't need to ask him. I already know what he's going to say. I've lived with him so long, I know all the things about him. Good things and bad. But that's the way it is. If we want a relationship with God, we have to be willing to pay the price to have that relationship. You see, God does not want a visitation. He wants a habitation. When we come into church on Sunday mornings, we don't leave Christ here with us at the altar in the pew. We take him home with us because he desires to be with us every single second of every single day. Most times when I wake up, I, I realize, God, thank you for another day. Lord, thank you that you guide me and you will guide me through this day. It is a relationship, but a relationship takes effort. You see, I can't help someone else if I need help myself spiritually. I can't carry a basket full of help for other people if I am not filled with God myself. I will never lead anybody in any church or any congregation someplace where I haven't already been. So it is up to me to maintain my relationship with God. And it and, and people don't backslide overnight, church. They don't wake up some morning and say, I think I'll be a drunkard today, or I think I'll be a drug addict today, or I think I'll just be a hypocrite today. That's not how it works. Slowly but surely, it, it begins to, you begin to stop talking and communicating with God. But how do you think I, I know the things about my husband and he knows about me? It's because we've spent years together talking and, and finding things out about one another. A lot of people, when they accept Christ, they think all they have to do is come to church on Easter and Christmas and maybe think about them once in a while when they need something, pull them off the shelf and ask them for it. That's not a relationship. And God is calling his people in these last days into a relationship. God does not want to date me. He does not want, he wants a bride without spot or wrinkle. So it is my responsibility to maintain my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. My husband loves me, but he can't do it for me. My children love me, but they can't do it for me. When that trumpet sounds or when I breathe my last breath, I'm not going to heaven because my mom and dad's over there. I'm not going to heaven because my sister's over there or my grandmother's over there. When I make it to heaven, it'll be caught me because of my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Nothing will ever, ever, ever take the place of that. But until my cup is full and running over, you know, I look at people sometimes and I say, Lord, that's the kind of anointing I want. Lord, that's the kind of heart and generosity and the types of things I want in my life. But you better believe that that person was willing to pay the price to have that. There is a price. Now, we are not saved by works. Salvation is free, but after we become saved, we best begin possessing the fruits of the Spirit. But a relationship must be fed. You know, even if you have a nice hot fire going, eventually that fire is going to go out if you don't throw something on it. If you don't feed something, it's going to die. I'll guarantee you, if you have a pet little pet dog and you don't feed that dog, he's eventually going to die. And that's the way it is spiritually, church. You know, I can tell, I can tell in no time at all when I start getting away from God. 
If I give up on my prayer life, if I give up on reading the word of God, if I just back up for a couple days, no sin, nothing like that, just back up, 